I'm, I'm really happy to be here today and to have the opportunity to speak with all of you and to hear your questions and comments at the end. Our program has been evolving for many, many years. And, um, you know, we're in just yet an, another iteration of um, trying to have a holistic integrated pest management approach um, to neighborhood rats across the city of New York. And um, I'm sure you you know how challenging it is and, um, and how many uh, bumps there are along the way. Um, I just wanted to say I'm joined today by Martha Morales. She's our community coordinator, and we're both happy to answer questions at the end of the presentation. OK, so let's make sure this. You just went on mute. You just went on mute, Carolyn. OK, and did the okay. slide advance for everyone? Great. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to start with a little bit of an introduction to pest control at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Um, our pest control program um, is uh, incorporated into the health department. Um, the pest control program has, um, has been a part of the New York City Department of Health for um, many, many, many decades, um, but the actual neighborhood rat reduction program has been um, newer, something that uh, we launched um, back in about 2005. Um, we started a more holistic a approach, and the program's really um, evolved um, since then. So I wanted to start with kind of just saying that pest control services here in New York, um, you know, we have an overall goal to uh, reduce rat activity in neighborhoods to prevent the transmission of rodent-borne disease, to prevent and reduce rodent bites, um, and to improve the overall quality of life for New York City residents. We have a lot of core activities that we've been doing for, as I said, decades, um, including responding to 311 complaints from the public. So any, any New Yorker can call 311 in our city and complain about rats and give us an address, and that generates a ticket in our system, which we respond to with an inspection. Um, we also have a proactive inspection program called RAT indexing, and that's at the core of our neighborhood approach, is really to um, inspect every property regardless of the complaint status, um, and to also focus both on public and private, um, privately owned properties. One of the things that we've also really worked hard to do is to d develop um, special initiative programs that can bring in funding to our program. So to, um, to, to move the program beyond our core activities and to um, really pilot different IPM approaches that we can then um, get small grants and, um, and uh, expansion money from, from the city to, to fund. We do have um, a pest management team. Um, we, we have a, a civil service title called exterminator, um, and we do employ um, exterminators who do treat um, uh, public and private properties across the, um, across the city. And we have a very robust training program um, that uh, we've uh, launched for in the beginning, it was for our partner agencies like public housing, the Parks Department, um, Department of Sanitation, um, but has really expanded um, to pest professionals across the city and, um, and to residents and property owners, business owners, um, community gardens, all different kinds of, of um, stakeholders across the city. Many of you may know uh, Dr. Bobby Corrigan, um, who started the three-day rat academy for pest professionals. Um, and now um, today we have Martha Morales who is running that, um, a shorter version of that rat academy um, for, for New York City residents. We also have made it a real um, priority to share our data. Um, we, we provide um, all results of our inspections on our New York City rat information portal 
And we also uh, post the data set on open data for interested researchers. Okay, I see what's happening now. When I try to advance my slides, it mutes me. There, hopefully that worked. Okay, so I wanted to start with a little bit of background on pest control inspections. Um, this will help uh, kind of set the stage for some of the database decision making that we do that I'm going to talk about later on in the presentation. So as I mentioned, we do inspect in response to a 311 complaint. Um, every complaint is uh, actual, actually treated as a service request. It generates a ticket for inspection. We do between 20 and 30,000 um, 311 inspections a year. We also have in, an inspection type called GEO, and these are for when an inspector is out there uh, responding to a complaint and they might see rat activity in on a block um, that was that we don't have a ticket for and they can add those um, observations to our database. Um, we have special inspections for um, unique initiative projects. I think the best example is our homeless shelter repair squad. Um, this is a special initiative where we have a team dedicated just to inspecting homeless shelters. Um, and this, this grew out of um, uh, basically a concern about 10 years ago that many homeless shelters were overrun with pests and unsafe places to live. And then um, the core of our neighborhood program is what we call rat indexing, where we'll go in and we'll just inspect everything in a neighborhood. And um, these inspections make up the bulk of the neighborhood um, inspections that we have. So if you can imagine there was a time pre-COVID when we were doing 170,000 indexing inspections a year. So um, it's really a, a huge data set and it and it helps us make decisions about where to spend our time and where to um, build a more robust response. And it allows us not to be kind of political in our decision making, but, but to really be led by the data. One of the other newer aspects that we have in our inspection program is something we call street area inspections. And these are for kind of atypical urban spaces, um, like a sewer opening, a catch basin, a tree well, a green street, things that don't typically have a tax lot ID um, that you would base an, um, an inspection off of, but that exist in our city and may be harboring rats in some ways. Um, one thing to note is that in New York City, we have two levels of inspection. We are primarily an enforcement program, um, but we do not do enforcement off of the first round of inspection. We only do them off of what we call compliance inspections. So all inspections in New York City start off um, with what we call uh, that it's an initial. So um, we, we will go in, we'll inspect everything and, um, with an initial inspection, and only those properties that are found to have rat activity or conditions that are highly conducive to rat activity will then move to the next level of compliance inspection. And properties that fail the initial inspection all get um, a, an official order from us here at the health department, asking them to take steps to abate the conditions on their property. We go back a month later, do a compliance inspection. If they fail again, that's when we take enforcement steps by issuing a summons. And then we will send our extermination team in and they may do uh, rodenticide applications um, or they may just monitor the property. Sometimes we'll send our stoppage team in for exclusion. Um, and this is when fines come into effect and the property owner may get billed for some of the work that we're doing. We also um, do a lot of public uh, outreach and education. Um, and our inspectors are trained to um, basically provide some 
key messaging to property owners on how to reduce and control rats on their property. Um, so I'm going to talk today, I, as I as I said, a, a lot about rat indexing, um, our efforts to basically calculate um, the level of neighborhood rat activity so that we can prioritize our responses. Um, I'm going to talk about a our rat reservoir program that um, was developed under Dr. Bobby Corrigan's um, guidance to respond to individual. Oh, hey, Caroline, I think you're muted. Caroline? Caroline? Caroline, you, Caroline you, you've you been muted. Oh, it went on mute again? Yeah, sorry, seconds. for about 10, yeah, 10 to 15 seconds. Okay, uh, every time I advance my slides, it goes into mute, and I'm not quite sure why, but I'll keep paying attention to it. Um, so d d um, were you able to hear about the rat reservoirs, or should I go back to that? Okay. Go Maybe go back a moment. Thank go you. Back. Okay. So um, the neighborhood rat reduction program is kind of made up of several different initiatives. And this is partly because of the way that funding comes through. Um, but I'm going to talk about these different initiatives, but all of them um, make up what we call neighborhood rat reduction. Um, so I, I mentioned rat indexing. That's the effort to go in and inspect everything in a neighborhood to calculate kind of a, a failure rate, the, the, the percent of properties that have rat activity in, in a neighborhood. This is what helps us prioritize where our resources will go. Um, but we also have a program called Attacking Rat Reservoirs. And this was a program that we developed to really respond to those tough areas um, that exist, maybe one neighborhood that has like repeated high failure rates um, where rat activity is really entrenched and despite you know, years of efforts um, hasn't been abated. And, and um, this program, we had special funding to hire extra staff to dedicate to those, to those areas. As I mentioned, we have a special program that's dedicated just to homeless shelters. We also have a special um, program that's dedicated just to NYCHA, which is the New York City Housing Authority. Um, this is public housing. They're the biggest landlord in New York City and probably one of the biggest landlords in the country. Um, so we have a special program just for NYCHA and just for, for homeless shelters, both very vulnerable um, uh, building types in our city um, uh, when, when you look overall at, at rat act activity. Um, the Mayor's Neighborhood Rat Reduction Initiative was funded in 2017. This, this was an effort to kind of tie together the many different initiatives we have um, and to build out a neighborhood approach. What was unique about Neighborhood Rat Reduction is that the Health Department was funded to lead the initiative, but every agency that is involved in rat management also got a pot of money so that they could staff up a team. So the Parks Department, the, um, the Housing Authority, Department of Education, um, uh, Department of Sanitation, we all got money so that we could participate in the program. All right, I'm gonna advance slide. Um, okay, so let's talk a, a minute about what, what is rat indexing in New York City. So in rat indexing, we send a team of inspectors to a neighborhood. So let's say the East Village of Manhattan, and they will go through the neighborhood with maps on a handheld computer and visually inspect the exterior of every single property, including parks, schools, housing, businesses, everything, for signs of rat activity. We will do every single block and lot, as well as the properties we call street areas. Every one of these inspections is scored for the severity of the rat activity. 
properties where we find rat activity, we send owners of that property a very simple order to abate, along with some guidance and some language on how to abate. Um, and then, as I said, we provide information um, about these failed inspections on our RAP portal. It's available to the community and it's available um, to community boards and other kind of municipal um, organizations or bodies to make decisions. When we find problem areas, um, we then can follow up with emergency work. Um, or, as I said, we can follow up with compliance inspections. In, um, in the rat reservoir program and neighborhood rat reduction, we have uh, both inspectors and a title called case manager um, who can go in and work at the neighborhood level. So they're not just following up on individual properties, but on the neighborhood as a whole. And this involves a lot of assessment, for example, Maybe 10 of 20 properties on a block have rat activity, um, but the rat activity is being driven by something that's happening with an individual business, a sewer system, um, or a park on the block. So we try to go to the root of the problem to respond. Um, the progression of our work always starts, as I said, with the initial inspection. We give the owners time to respond and then we do compliance inspections. If uh, the second inspection fails, we follow up with some treatments with rodenticides or monitoring if it, the property is already being treated by a private company or a contractor. Um, we may also perform um, what we call assessments for cleanup. So if there's like a vacant lot with a lot of dumping, we might go in and clean that property. Anything that happens after the orange square compliance, extermination, assessments, and cleanup are billed to the property owner. They get it on their tax bill. Um, so I, I mentioned the rat reservoir program. This is a term that was coined by Bobby Corrigan. Um, we initiated this program way back in 2014. As, as I said, it's kind of a funding stream that came to us um, to uh, really address areas that had large numbers of rats that um, were kind of um, persisting uh, beyond our best efforts to respond. And these really were um, features of city owned properties like like the sewer system, like parks. Um, like some of our green streets um, and, uh, and, and of course in public housing and, and as I said, homeless shelters. Um, the uh, Rat Reservoir Program um, is basically um, uh, rooted in the rat indexing approach where we go in and we inspect everything and then we carve out the blocks that have the highest level of rat activity for our response. Um, and what we do is we commit to reinspecting at least once a year so that we can evaluate changes in rat populations and adjust our response as needed. Um, I, I mentioned earlier on that we also have this homeless shelter program. You know, one, at one time in New York City, we had 500 plus homeless shelters, you know, housing thousands and thousands of people. And as you can imagine, a lot of these homeless shelters were really in disrepair. And um, this was all happening at a time in the city also when the homeless population was really exploding and the city um, started uh, contracting um, out to what we were calling cluster sites. So th these were private buildings that were accepting homeless clients and um, it became um, a little bit of a political scandal that a lot of these buildings were in, in, in disrepair and were unsafe. Um, and one of the primary conditions observed were, um, were extreme pest activity. Um, so we were, the city was paying for people to live in housing that was substandard and, and infested. So um, the health department received money um, to dedicate inspectors to inspecting um, all homeless shelters and cluster sites twice a year. 
and more often if they fail that inspection. We also got money to hire an IPM contractor that will provide IPM services in the apartments of the homeless clients. So what we can do is if we find a building that has a severe infestation impacting the, the clients living in the shelter, we can send an IPM um, vendor in um, and they'll seal up holes and cracks, they'll do a, a cleaning, a HEPA vacuum, um, and they'll put down some RTUs for mice and some uh, gel baits for roaches, um, which uh, you know we're, we're hoping it's a little bit of a band-aid because some of these buildings have huge structural problems, but it helps kind of promote the idea that IPM is a response um, uh, for the, some of these long-term um, uh, problems at, at shelters. Okay, so moving on, um, the biggest uh, pot of funding received to date for uh, uh, rat initiatives in New York City is, is Mayor de Blasio's Neighborhood Rat Reduction Program. So um, Mayor de Blasio initiated this program in July of 2017 and and basically he decided to dedicate 32 million dollars to pest management and specifically to rat management and um he he came to us here at the health department to lead the effort but most of the funding actually went to our partner agencies so it went to public housing it went to parks sanitation and department of ed and the aim was to focus our efforts collaboratively on, um, on the rat reservoirs on city owned property. And this really came out of a recognition that in many ways city owned property was driving the rat problem here in New York City. We were given three large neighborhood areas to pilot this program with the idea that if we could do a robust evaluation, we would get funding to expand citywide. Um, and we have been uh, periodically evaluating this program since 2017 when we launched. Okay, so um, there are gonna be some maps here showing some of the neighborhoods we're working in so you can kind of get a picture of how we work. So this is a tax lot map of the East Village, Lower East Side and Chinatown neighborhood of Manhattan. This is our neighborhood rat reduction zone um, and what we've done here is you can see um, public housing is highlighted in orange parks are highlighted in green and schools are highlighted in pink so what you can see here is how important publicly owned property is to the neighborhood um, public properties have a huge impact on neighborhoods and um, what we knew from years and years of doing inspections is that public properties do have a much higher tendency to fail rat inspections than private properties. In particular, housing, public housing, and parks. This is our Bronx rat mitigation zone. It's in light blue as the entire neighborhood. And here again, you can see the orange public housing, parks in green, and schools in pink. Again, you can see the incredible impact that public property has on um, these neighborhoods. Now, what I also wanna point out here is the areas of darker blue on this map. Now, these areas were areas that from our previous rat indexing efforts, we had recognized as blocks that had rat reservoirs, higher rates of rat activity than nearby blocks. So we knew going into this program that we were choosing um, an area of the city that had a very high rate of infestation. And we knew this because we were choosing properties that had both failed more often um, in, uh, uh, in rat inspections and also 
um, by choosing blocks that had higher numbers of properties that had failed rat inspections. Um, the, la the last map is the Brooklyn neighborhood rat reduction zone. Um, and again, you can kind of, you're getting a, a picture now of what you're looking at, um, uh, public housing, schools, parks, and rat reservoirs. So um, across the board, when you're looking at all of these properties, um, uh, we're talking again about, um, I'm trying to think of the exact number, between 30 and 40,000 properties. That, that we're monitoring in this program. Um, politically, uh, I'm sure you, you all are familiar, oftentimes um, when you launch a big program like that, you have other areas saying, we want to be part of this pilot. So when we launched this program, we also had an area of Manhattan called the Upper West Side that lobbied to be included and um, we, we are now also monitoring the Upper West Side for rat activity in addition to the other three zones. The Upper West Side was an area that had very, very high numbers of complaints um, that were driven by conditions um, at playgrounds in Riverside Park. Riverside Park is this long park in green that borders the Hudson River. It has very, very high foot traffic and food service in the park and traditionally had had um, uh, you know really challenging rat rat problems because of close proximity to the water and and as I said high foot traffic and a really ha um, high litter load okay so I'm I'm going to continue to talk about some of the um, uh, important work of neighborhood rat reduction and, and start off by talking about um, the importance of monitoring the public, publicly owned properties. Um, so again, because of our previous data collection efforts, we knew that um, New York City Housing Authority, NYCHA, and the Parks Department, um, that their properties were kind of driving a lot of the rat um, activity in, in the neighborhoods we're working with. So, um, as I said, NYCHA and Parks got quite a lot of funding to staff up their rat um, management programs. And the health department, my team, committed to doing a monthly survey of all their properties in those zones we just showed you the maps of. So that was 103 public housing developments and 133 parks. And we used... Um, we used a, a, a survey app that we had developed that um, for NYCHA was available on a smartphone and for parks was a, um, available on our handheld um, inspection units. Some of the examples of what these surveys look like, um, you'll see we, we really use mapping technology a lot. So what you're looking at here is a map of a large housing development um, in gray, you'll see the outlines of each building. In red, you're seeing where the inspector identified a rat burrow. So now when you look at these maps and you think that on average, you might have about 10 rats living in each burrow, and many burrows located around the foundations of each building, you can see these housing developments were harboring hundreds and hundreds of rats. And when we launched this program, there were some large housing developments that had over a thousand rat burrows. And it took us up to three days to count them and survey them and map them. But the investment in doing this meant that we could direct the staff at the housing authority to go in and make sure they were treating all of these rat burrows and responding to the conditions that were um, allowing those rats to survive uh, to thrive which was basically uncontained garbage throughout the development um, by tracking and counting these rat burrows we could try different interventions and then see over time if the number of rat burrows declined and um, 
you'll see how we track this as an indicator. So we count the number of rat burrows and we, and we uh, graph them over time as we try different interventions. We did something very similar with park surveys. So with park surveys, we'd go in and do a survey where we would count rat burrows. We would also do an overall assessment of the park. What's the litter load? What kind of trash cans did they have? Um, many of our parks in the Bronx um, are um, on hills and they have retaining walls. And when we first started, many of these retaining walls, like you see here, were just littered with rat burrows. Um, so we would note structural holes versus earthen holes. Now, this slide takes a, a minute to digest, but this is the data dashboard that we developed using the surveys and the rat indexing data to track and evaluate our work. So now, if you can imagine, we started this work with monthly surveys of city property and twice annual rounds of rat indexing on private property. And we've been tracking these indicators, borough counts, and the number or percent of properties failing inspections for rats. We've been tracking all of this data since 2017, and we can really see um, the trends um, over time. And it's been really, really helpful because when um, we first started, uh, and everyone got their money and everyone was very excited, we saw a real rapid decline in rat activity at NYCHA and parks in particular. The numbers just crashed. And it was really because for the first time ever, they knew someone was watching and counting. And, um, and then they were able to basically harness that information and respond. And you can see here um, in the far left, you, you can see uh, the baseline counts of, of where we were. So we started um, with a baseline overall uh, uh, for, uh, failure rate um, in rat indexing of 15% of all the properties inspected had some kind of rat activity. And we had a target of trying to bring those neighborhoods down to 4%. Um, similarly, uh, for 311 complaints, we had a target of number of complaints received and, um, and how to bring that uh, down. Each goal was a 70% reduction. We had um, uh, NYCHA borough counts and parks borough counts also, where we had a, a baseline and a target, and, um, and every month we tracked the current status. Um, now, because the mayor was the, was the person um, driving this special initiative and, and funding this initiative, um, it was really important um, to him to track 311 complaints. And, um, and these are, again, complaints received from residents about rat sightings um, in their neighborhoods and on their properties. And you can see uh, that the trend line for rat activity, um, you know, has really uh, followed kind of the same pattern. You know, there's a very strong seasonal pattern where rat activity kind of peaks between um, April and August and then declines in the colder months. Um, but you can also see here um, that we had a huge uh, decline in rat complaints um, in 2020. I sorry, I don't have my pointer up, but if you direct your eye to the black line that is 2020 and you look at March of 2020, you'll see is the lowest number of complaints um, we had that year. And that was when New York City went on pause and the city shut down. Um, and uh, uh, basically closed up due to, to COVID. So everyone went into um, quarantine and was home and we had a very low number of complaints. If you follow that line um, up to, to May, May is when the city started slowly to reopen. Um, and you can see uh, the reopening process 
led to um, a return um, of the complaint pattern back to to what it typically is. Um, this was tough for us because, uh, of course, you can imagine we got a lot of press requests saying, why are complaints rapidly increasing? And we were trying to explain, well, they're, they're where they are at a typical time. Um, it was just this crash in complaints when everyone went home um, that was the, the difference. Another thing I wanted to note is that um, basically 2020 was a year when most of my team in neighborhood rat reduction was reassigned to do uh, COVID inspections. And we had to stop a lot of the proactive neighborhood work um, and, and redirect inspection staff to, um, to work on COVID. What has happened subsequently is that in 2021, this yellow line, when um, we returned staff to some of the work, that what we found was we were, we're now having in 2021 record numbers of complaints. Um, in fact, the highest numbers of complaints that we've seen in quite some time, um, which to me shows that pausing our programs um, really also kind of opened the floodgates for um, increasing rat activity in New York. And it wasn't just us at the health department that were, were impacted operationally by COVID. Department of Sanitation, very importantly, also had service cuts, which led to more garbage being on the streets. Um, Department of Ed was offering um, uh, uh, feeding programs and, and distributing a lot of food, but um, you know the staff weren't on site, so there was like no cleaning around those buildings. Um, people were using parks like as large outdoor living places and cafeterias because, you know, everyone was told, you know, outdoors was safer than indoors. So parks kind of became the living room of New York City. So what we're seeing now really is that um, we're having kind of record amounts of rat complaints and we're seeing extremely high um, failure rates for rat activity in, in all of our neighborhoods. Um, so I, 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 um, I'm going to return back now to talking about what some of the key elements of our approach were after I've now told you all that most of 2020 and now starting uh, right now as, this, as we go into our next phase of our COVID response, many of our programs um, for neighborhood rat reduction are actually once again on pause, um, but I wanted to look back and talk to you about what some of the successful elements of our of our program really were and, and why we um, were able to get them put into place. So one of the things that we knew from our data collection efforts is that litter baskets um, often drove rat activity in commercial districts. Um, so, you know, people in um, would visit Chinatown. It's full of food service establishments. They would buy lots of food. They would eat, and it, and and all that garbage would be kind of dumped in these mesh litter baskets, which were basically, um, in in turn, cafeterias for rats. And rats were just feeding living in the sewers, coming up, feeding in these mesh litter baskets. So one of the things we did is, is, as part of neighborhood rat reduction is we purchased hundreds of big belly solar compacting smart cans to put in business districts that um, would basically prevent rats from, from feeding on the garbage. We also set ourselves out with the goal of replacing all mesh cans in New York, all, all mesh litter baskets with solid steel cans. Um, there was also a, a recognition that at public housing um, that many of the, uh, the garbage um, containment infrastructure was so broken down that it had that it was just again, like I said, a, a rat cafeteria. So um, we got a large amount of money to get new garbage compactors for public housing developments. 
we also um, really tried to raise the awareness that garbage and garbage management was 100% necessary to achieve rat management. So what we did was a lot of education with our elected officials to try to help people understand that rat management in a neighborhood wasn't just about sending exterminators out to treat individual properties with rats. It was really about reducing the load of, of food waste um, that existed in our neighborhoods and denying rats access to food. So we, we got some new laws um, to help legislate good traffic. Caroline, you've gone on mute again. About 10 seconds. Okay, sorry. Um, I'm not sure where I left off and I didn't even push a button that time. Um, oh, so going back, I'm talking about the, um, uh, some of the foundation of neighborhood rat management was to uh, address New York City's garbage problem. And um, this effort uh, was really, you know, uh, a holistic approach to um, creating a garbage management plan for New York City. So it included um, bringing uh, solar comp compacting big bellies to neighborhoods, replace replacing mesh cans with solid steel, putting new garbage compactors in public housing, educating legislators about trash management, and increasing service um, in neighborhoods and in um, commercial districts to remove garbage um, more quickly so rats wouldn't be able to, to feed. Okay, let's see if I can go to the next slide without muting. Okay, um, this is a picture of the Big Belly. I'm not sure if San Francisco uses these. These are uh, solar compacting cans. Um, they have a foot pedal and um, a slot here. We, we really believe these cans are, are rat resistant. Um, and these are the cans that we put in, in both parks and in commercial areas. We also put up a, a media campaign try, trying to tell New Yorkers like your litter goes here, belongs in a trash can, not on the street. Um, and we tried to, to let people know that, you know, your litter is actually feeding rats. Um, and uh, we put this out in multiple languages and in neighborhoods across New York City. Um, there were a couple problems with the Big Belly. We, we had enormous um, aspirations to containerize all food waste in these cans, but we quickly realized there were some operational difficulties Mainly, uh, it was the people that had a hard time. So in the beginning, we saw that people couldn't figure out how to use them, and they thought they were a mailbox or something, so they weren't using them. Sometimes they would balance their garbage on top of the can, or they would place it next to the can, but they wouldn't put it in the can. That was very frustrating and disappointing for us. Um, the other, the other thing is these, these cans are smart cans where, um, and they're solar powered, where the can will alert um, a worker when it's full or 80% full so it can be serviced. Um, so the other issue that we were having is that people would jam like a pizza box in the top and, um, and it would create these alerts. So lots of operational issues. Um, where we've had a steep learning curve over time. Um, we had, again, big aspirations for this project, and we're continuing to learn how to kind of make it better. Um, one thing that we do know is that private entities are much better operators of big bellies than public ones, mainly because it's a scale problem. When you're managing thousands of these across the city, getting um, little alerts that they're full becomes complicated, um, whereas a smaller uh, kind of um, business district might be able to to manage 20 of them quite successfully. Um, again, we used maps uh, to manage uh, the, the big belly usage. Here's you can see a map of Chinatown um, where we put a ton of these big bellies up. 
Um, and then you can also see in blue uh, big bellies that we placed in high foot traffic parks. Um, we also mapped corner waste baskets, and when we couldn't place a big belly, we uh, placed solid steel cans to hold litter. And as I said, we increased the litter basket service to six times per week from three times. Now, I also said during COVID that service was all cut, um, which is partly why we think we had such a massive rebound in, in rat activity. Um, and residential service was also initially increased and then cut um, during, during the COVID response. Um, here's an example of the mesh can versus the solid steel. Uh, you can see on the right um, the version of the more rat resistant solid steel can than the, um, than the old version of the, um, the mesh can um, that was really recognized by us as, as a driving force for rat activity in our neighborhoods. Um, okay, so I, I, I mentioned several times that we also um, have a special initiative focused on schools. In New York City, um, schools are feeding thousands and thousands of, of people every day, um, teachers, um, staff, uh, and children. And um, often schools are serving three meals a day and um, sometimes four. And what we have seen in New York is that schools generate huge amounts of food waste, but they were never built to accommodate any kind of garbage storage. So most schools don't have compactors. Most schools don't have a, a, an area that is um, to containerize their food waste. Um, most schools, in fact, were, prior to this initiative, storing all of their food waste from, from feeding all of their children on the curb in plastic bags many times for days on end. Uh, which, as you can imagine, was driving people crazy because you would see huge amounts of rat activity outside of, uh, of, of public schools. Um, out of recognition that this was a problem, but also that the, 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 the food waste itself was a problem, there have been various complementary initiatives to um, uh, recycle food waste from schools um, and then also to containerize it. Um, my favorite initiative um, is part of the city's zero waste plan, and this was to separate food waste away from other recyclable material and to store food waste in a brown bin that was then picked up by Department of Sanitation and brought to um, a composting facility to be recycled back into to New York City parks. Again, a beloved program of ours that was put on pause during COVID and is just getting ready to launch um, once again after being on pause for a year and a half. Um, as I said, food waste is separated, stored in brown bins that are rat resistant and then picked up by Department of Sanitation. Moving on to, to parks, um, I think uh, in, in San Francisco, you probably might recognize that Parks um, provide an ideal habitat for rats. Parks have the available earth and space um, that rats seek to develop their burrow systems um, and often are used um, in urban spaces as kind of like the city's living room. People have parties in parks, people go to picnic in parks, and, um, and parks are often filled with um, food service, um, food trucks, other kinds of um, uh, food kiosks and, and people just spend a lot of time eating in parks. Um, similarly to, to schools, they, there was no waste management plan at parks prior to us starting. Um, garbage was often left in parks out um, and there was very little staffing to clean. Um, so sometimes on a weekend after a Friday night, you would see uh, food waste that was then left out to sit and, and for rats to feed right up until Monday when, when the park staff uh, uh, returned. 
Um, we've really worked hard uh, to make sure that Parks Department has um, staff to respond to to um, the the high level of use that the parks have and that they can clean seven days a week instead of just on the weekdays. Um, we've also tried to uh, get parks funding to have evening crews so that they're not only working in, in the morning and early parts of the day. Um, New York City also uh, received funding to start what we call a stoppage team, um, which primarily works in parks. And this team would go in and address uh, borough systems that were coming up again in public infrastructure. Here they are working in kind of a green street, not an official park, where rat burrows were all around a sewer drain. And this team would go in and do some repairs um, to exclude rats from that, uh, that system. They would um, seal up holes in the cracks that allow the free movement of, of rats. Um, of course, we have exterminators too. So we have 34 exterminators that work in our unit, um, 15 dedicated to just neighborhood rat reduction. They do use rodenticides, um, but we also evaluate other products, including uh, dry ice, which you can see in this picture here. Um, we try to follow um, IPM principles in all our treatments, um, but we do treat when property owners themselves fail to do so. Um, so finally, you know, they you know, we we want to bring the public along with us. You know, we're we're trying to take this holistic approach, but, um, you know, we also know that people need to understand what we're doing and also understand why rats are such a problem in New York City. And, you know, one of our um, signature efforts has been to expand the, the Rat Academy model, where we go in and offer uh, free training um, to all different kinds of audiences in New York City. Um, when the Rat Academy was first launched in New York, it was a three-day professional course taught by Dr. Bobby Corrigan. Um, now it's a, a course that can be offered in modules that are two to three hours, and again, can be tailored to all audiences, community gardeners, building supers, homeowners, um, business owners. We, we realized it was really important to tailor the message and that you don't want to just educate pest professionals, you have to educate everyone um, because as we say, everyone has a role in rat control. Um, the three-day course continues to operate in New York. Um, Bobby is, is with us teaching that class. Um, Pre-COVID, it was offered twice a year to pest professionals. Um, and the community-sponsored Rat Academy has uh, made a successful uh, transition um, from an in-person academy to a remote academy and is actually booming. We are, we've been able to offer the academy throughout the pandemic um, and actually going remote expanded our reach and our ability to, to access, again, many, many different audiences across New York City. Um, I, one of the uh, signature uh, modules of the Rat Academy is the one we do for community gardeners. It's very popular and it's very needed. Community gardens can be big harborage points for rats and we do a lot of focused educating of um, urban gardeners and tree pit stewards to help um, to help them kind of join us in the um, in our rat management efforts. Um, we also have a data driven approach to the Rat Academy. So we we recognize we didn't want to just um, uh, in the beginning, I'll say we mainly were getting requests for Rat Academy by like the same people um, in, in Manhattan. And we really wanted to monitor where we were offering Academy to make sure we also uh, were reaching underserved audience. Um, we had a goal of offering a certain number of academies in every neighborhood that we worked in, and that's kind of helped us be honest about where we're spending our time um, and not just uh, responding to uh, to wealthier or um, more connected um, neighborhoods. Uh, 
We have a guide that we also share. Um, this is available to anyone who wants it in the city in multiple languages. We have um, so many different um, educational materials that are also up on our, our RAD information portal. Um, so in addition to outreach and education materials, the portal has an interactive map where any owner can find uh, inspection information, um, including our most recent inspections, our history of inspections, and our history of follow-up actions. So for example, uh, if you're, it, it, you know, if you're walking down Canal Street in Chinatown, you see a lot of rats, um, you might pick up a, the phone and call 311, or you could check the rat portal and say, oh, look, um, the health department was just there in August. We did an inspection, we did a bait application, and know, hopefully, in a reassuring way, that we're often already on top of areas that, that have problems. Um, uh, other times an owner might find, oh, the health department hasn't been here recently, and, and then we welcome them to, to call in a complaint and to, to um, help us initiate an action on an area with rats. All right, I'm, I really am nearing the end. You guys are being really patient. Um, I wanted to talk about legislation a little bit um, because in the outset of this program in 2017, we thought um, the legislation would be um, an important aspect. And again, a lot of our efforts to educate um, legislators were focused on really making them understand that rat management won't happen until New York City figures out a way to do garbage management. And um, so we, we, we tried to work with individual uh, city council members to develop all different kinds of bills that focused on um, problem areas like illegal dumping, um, improper disposal, which is a version of illegal dumping, um, cleaning up areas around food service establishments that had a lot of grease and spillage and food, food waste remnants. Um, we tried to increase fines for littering because littering is so pervasive in New York um, and also to increase the use of organic recycling, so food waste recycling. We wrote every bill you could possibly imagine and uh, unfortunately we're largely unsuccessful in, get about in getting the legislation passed. The only bills that really were successful um, were focused on illegal dumping and improper disposal. We were able to increase fines for dumping. Um, but the more ambitious and um, bills that we had that were focused on um, getting people to recycle food waste, um, getting people to uh, place their garbage out on the curb in the morning instead of at night, um, those were largely um, unsuccessful, um, and we didn't have the political motivation to get them to get them through, unfortunately. So I'm going to end with saying, um, you, you know, this has been an incredible program, and um, I have to say, you know, we were in a really good place prior to COVID. Um, in 2019, at the end of the year, we were getting ready to do a big press event celebrating successes. Um, we had achieved a 70% knockdown in rat activity in parks and in public housing. We had seen a 20 to 30% reduction in rat activity in, in, in the neighborhoods we were indexing. We were feeling really confident about our success. And then COVID hit and we were shut down. And I have to say now, at, you know, in September of 2021, we're seeing record levels of rat activity across the city. And our staff are, you know, stuck doing COVID inspections. And we really, it's been very difficult, you know, getting back on, on track. Garbage problems are really pervasive in our high need neighborhoods and garbage service is one of the first things that gets cut in, in a budget crisis. Um, New York already has a high tolerance for garbage. 
so, you know, in the pandemic, when um, everyone was sent home, some of the initial cuts were around street cleaning and litter basket service. And it really, really hit us hard. Um, now that the city's reopening, everyone wants the si silver bullet, you know, more exterminators. Um, and it's just, it's been very hard to promote the idea of, of prevention. Um, I think, you know, we talk a lot about continuing our research. We'd like to publish some of the evaluation work that we've done on this program. Um, but one of the big, you know, questions that still is, is driving um, our program is how can we direct or change municipal garbage pickups um, to, to impact rodent populations at a city level? This has been so hard. We're a big city. We have lots of residents. We have lots of businesses. We have huge amounts of garbage, and we really have been unsuccessful at figuring out a way of keeping that garbage away from rats um, to feed. The other thing we still struggle with is the question of rodenticide treatment overall. Is it actually even effective at the city level? We see that when done judiciously and correctly at an individual property, it can make an impact at that property, but we're not seeing large changes over time in rat activity, even though the city has increased uh, rodenticide use, which is very interesting because we can add more and more rodenticide, but we're, we're still seeing, as I said, record highs uh, of rat activity. So I will, I will end there. Um, as I said, you guys have been incredibly patient and I've talked for a really long time. I'd like to be quiet and hear any questions or, or comments. Um, I will turn off the presentation now. Um, you can always reach me at my email address, um, cbragdonathealth.nyc.gov, or you can reach our program through our RAP portal. Um, we, we, uh, we, we love collaborating and we, we love hearing um, uh, you know, from partners and stakeholders.